Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Marilyn Omifunke Torres, and I'm going to be your host for this evening's presentation and gathering. We are excited to have you here because, of course, every month we have an opportunity to come and come together and have stories. And so I welcome each and every one of you to this evening's event, ASU's CARES. And with that being said, there are a couple of housekeeping things that I want to share with you immediately. First and foremost, it's always for me a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to see all of you here. It feels really good, don't you think, to finally be in the space with people. Let's give that a round of applause. Yay, we're here live with people. And the theme this evening is do-over. And each teller that's going to be here, including myself, has a particular approach and theme around how we're going to interpret the concept of do-over. And we all know, after all that we've been through, in many cases, we really want to do some things over. So let's see what the stories are going to entail. One of the stories is a traditional story that I'll be bringing to you. I am a traditional teller of the Yoruba traditional people of West Africa, Nigeria, as well as a teller from the Taino ancestry that I carry from the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico that you know and we know as Borinquen, and then, of course, here, born and raised in New York City. So with that, I bring that intersectional element of what I share. And with that, we have a couple of housekeeping things I want to share with you. First, after our tellers tell, we're going to have a fabulous chat here, a chance for you to think about the things that we're going to say and ask questions and to have responses associated with that. So let's get started. My approach to do over was when I heard the theme, first and foremost, I sat and immediately a story came to me. It's a story that I received traditionally. It's a story that has never been written down, and I haven't told it in a long time. And given where we are today, I think do-over is really what we're all exploring. The language that I'm going to speak and the song that I'm going to sing is Yoruba, and Yoruba are from the indigenous people of West Africa, Nigeria, one of the tribes in that area that's linked to my ancestral lineage. The song that I'm going to sing briefly is to honor the opening of how the story is going to transcend into the space. Now, among the Yoruba people of my ancestors, the goddess of the river we call Oshun, the sweet waters of life. And there are many stories connected to this goddess. But the one I want to share with you is one that I think is very revel relevant today. It is said long ago, when the earth was first created and humans were created, all of the elemental forces took on various symbols. And one of those symbols were the bird clans. And in particular, the goddess of the river, Oshun, well, she, she decided that she would take on the symbol of the bird clan, the peacock. And of course, the peacock used to love to perch itself up on branches and watch as all the other divinities among the Yoruba traditions took on symbols, like the thunder and fire took on the eagle, I and the whirlwinds and mother of change, oh yeah, she took on the hawk. There's no time to tell you all of the bird clans and all of the elements they represented. But one thing we knew, there was one force we called Obatala. And that divinity well, was responsible for the creation of humanity. And it is said that a time came, one would say that humanity began to lose its perspective. 
And that perspective put humanity a little bit out of balance with the earth. And so all of the bird clans, symbolizing all of the elemental forces of nature, gathered together. And they began to discuss, what must we do? And it was said, we must fly. We must fly through the ozone layers of the earth and through the stars and land in the great council of what we would say is Ogba Ashe, the kingdom where all decisions were made in the other realms for the earth. Well, as the birds gathered together, the eagle came and said, I will be the first to go. And so the eagle perched itself high, high, high in the highest tree. And the eagle began to swirl and swirl and swirl and swirl. And as it got to that realm between the stars and the earth, the eagle felt the fire burning all over its body. And oh, it said no. And it turned around and landed back down on the earth. Well, the peacock was sitting up on the tree watching everything that was happening. Well, the hawk said, well, I will try. And so the hawk, she began to fly and swirl and swirl and swirl. And in that swirl and swirl and swirl, she too got to that realm between heaven and earth. Hi. And felt the fire burning her wings. And she said no and turned around and shoo, she landed back down on the earth. And one after another, every bird made the decision to try. While the peacock just sat there watching. And then the moment came when the dove, who was the leader of the decisions of how we could get the message to give humanity a chance. Well, the dove looked up and the peacock looked down. And they remembered all kinds of other encounters, but that's another story. Hi. The peacock perched herself down and sat right on the lowest branch and said, I will go. And all and all of the birds began to laugh. You, peacock. Oriayel, you, Oshun. Oh, no, you are, look at your, no, you're not going to do this. And she said, for the sake of the children, and for the sake of the earth, yes, I will. And all the other birds were kind of laughing and jesting. And the peacock fluttered, perched up one branch, fluttered, perched up the next, and continued and continued and continued until she got to the top of the tree. And then she leaped up into the sky and began to swirl and swirl and swirl. And as she got higher and higher and higher, she felt the fire burning all of her beautiful feathers. But she kept going and going and going and she broke the barrier and went all up into the stars until she got to the gates of Ogba Ashe, the place where all the council was waiting. And she landed right there at the entrance. All of her beautiful feathers burned black. Her peacock face was all filled with the redness of the fire. And they looked and they said, what is this? And as she lifted her head, they saw in her eyes, oh my. This surely cannot be the peacock. And she nodded weak. And they took her to a realm and began to minister over her entire body. And the time came where she was able to sit in front of the great council. And she said, you must give humanity a chance. They have lost perspective. I have come and I have sacrificed all that I could. Please, for the sake of the children. And as she stood up, her feathers now transformed into a new kind of bird symbol.
The council said, yes, go back. We have heard your cry. We will give humanity a chance to do it over again and care for all that we have created. And so with the joy in her heart, knowing she no longer carried the appearance that she once loved to perch herself on the tree and swing her beautiful tail. She turned around and she was given fire and she was given rain and she was given all the elemental forces and she began to fly, fly, fly. And as she was coming down closer and closer to the earth, she pierced through the veil. And all of the bird clan began to see thunder and lightning and rain coming towards them, beginning to feed the earth again. But there was this creature that they could not recognize. What was it? And she landed and spread out her wings. She was now the vulture. And they looked and they said, who is this? And when they looked into her eyes, they saw that it was Oshun. And they knew she made the ultimate sacrifice for all of the children on the earth. And she gave the message that the great council in Ogbashe in the gates of the unrealm known that we cannot see as humans, have given humanity a chance to do it over again, to care for the earth, to care for especially the rivers, which are the domain of Oshun. For without the sweet waters of life, nothing can live. And when the rain began to fall upon the earth, things began to transform. And it was said, that from this day forward, if your heart is heavy, if you're worried about the things that you may need to do over, look up in the sky. And if you see a vulture swirling, know that your prayers and your thoughts have reached the gates and you will get a chance to do it over again. <laughs> Heondo, Bogbo Hashe, Hobinisa, Wole, Modupue, Nevelese, Olodumari. Thank you from all that is above and all that is below, that we, through the power of the goddess of love, beauty, and the sweet waters of life, remind us there's always a second chance. Thank you. So for me, it is always a pleasure to be here and to share stories with you. I am a traditional teller from the West African region of Nigeria, of the Yoruba people of my ancestral line, of my father's line. I am also a traditional teller from the native side of my lineage of the Taino people. And I am also a traditional teller from all of the beautiful stories that have come, indeed, from the island of Spain the country of Spain, and the islands of the Caribbean. So with that, there's a couple of housekeeping things I'm going to share with you before I introduce our next teller. We're going to have an opportunity to have a talk. Think about the questions that you may have and how the stories unfolded. And our guests who are here to tell two personal stories will also have an opportunity to sit and we'll ask questions, we'll take your questions, and from all of you who are out there listening, welcome to this evening's gathering where we all get to think about what does it mean to do it over again. And so with that, it is my joy and my pleasure to introduce to you Violet Duncan. Now, Violet Duncan, I know as a closer person than just introducing her tonight. So Violet, it is so great to see you again, to hear you tell stories. Violet brings traditional knowledge and traditional wisdom from the Cree nation, from the Taino nation. She has just an incredible dossier of so many things that she has done and accomplished, but most importantly, Violet is now part of Random House. She has been publishing books. When she became a mother, she saw the necessity to keep those stories alive, to keep the traditions alive. And Violet, 
she comes to tell us a story of the indigenous people of this land. Let's welcome Violet Duncan. Dun said, Nitiga Sung Kayas Gisigisquelm, Kihun Cree Nation O Tinia. Good evening and welcome. My name is Violet Duncan. I'm Plains Cree and Taino. I'd like to share with you a personal story. And it's very rare that I share personal stories because trickster stories, the creation stories, and our traditional stories are my absolute favorite. So I'm feeling very vulnerable tonight sharing this with you. As the theme goes, do over. As I learned this theme, I thought of my youth. Now, given the chance, would you have a do-over in a presentation in life? Would you be more brave? Would you be more kind? What if you had the opportunity to do something over again? What if you dreamed it first and were able to act on that? When I was younger, we lived near a town called Witaskwin. The locals now call it Witaskwin. Witaskwin in Kihuan, in the Cree language, it means the meeting place. As a young child, we lived in a beautiful white house with a gorgeous backyard. In front of our house was a park with rolling hills. I loved to be there. It was that playground and that park that brought me so much joy after school. I'm talking about rural, rural northern Alberta, Canada. It was late summer when I had this first dream. They say the dream world could be divine intervention. It's the paranormal communication with us in this realm. I remember having this nightmare, this dream, that we were all having a glorious day at the playground. I climbed to the top of the hill, valiant and proud, and I would show up my parents. And I was yelling them to look at me, look over here at me, I was saying, but they couldn't hear me. Just then, the hill started to go down into the ground. It started to take me down with it. I started to claw at the grass that was around me, but it kept sucking me down. The roots came up and pulled at my legs and pulled at my arms. I woke up shooken in a sweat tangled in my blankets. What was that dream, I thought? That's strange. Not only would I have it again, I would have it until I was almost 15 years old. The same dream, going to the park, beautiful day, climbing this beautiful hill, standing at the top proud. But sometimes in the dream, I would remember what's going to happen. I need to remember that the hill is going to sink down, I thought. I need to get to the bottom of the hill faster. I would start running down and still the hill would go down and it would consume me. It would grab me and pull me into the ground. And I would wake up every night frustrated that I just couldn't get over this. I couldn't go down the hill to safety. I remember yelling to my mom and dad at the top of my lungs only to wake up and not a sound came out. As the years went by, I started to forget about this dream. I would tell a few friends about it and I would say, isn't that strange? Have you ever heard of a reoccurring dream? This is an awful nightmare that I kept having. But alas, I eventually stopped having it and I didn't think about it again. I do remember though, in the dream, it was a clear blue sky. One blackbird flies by and five from the other direction. And you have to remember that because that was key for later. This is the story I'd like to share with you on how I met an angel on earth and how a dream saved my life. If we fast forward now to 2006, I had just won the title of Miss Indian World. Me and my mom were sitting in our hotel room staring at the glistening crown. We were so proud of ourselves, but we were certain the committee was going to come in and say, sorry, we tabulated wrong, we're taking the crown, and we were ready for it. It's not going to happen, my mom would say. You won. It's okay. I made a mistake. They made a mistake. I can't believe we're going to do this. I had a whole year ahead of me with all these exciting events that I can go present with this beautiful crown. That night, I had a dream. I dreamed that I was dancing in a beautiful courtyard. There was moss in the corner of it, and I was dancing all by myself in my traditional outfit. And I remember smiling and feeling so good. That dream felt so real that when I woke up, I woke up with a smile. My mom said, see, the crown is still here. You still get to be Miss Indian World. 
I didn't tell my mom about that dream, but that would be another dream that I would have again a few weeks later, and again a few months later. As I was Miss Indian World, I would go off on my own and I would visit different communities and different nations and it was a proud time, but it was also very lonely. It wasn't until November, the crowning was in April, it wasn't until November I could finally connect with my mom again. And she would ask me, how is everything going? How are you doing? And I told her, you know what, I need to tell you about this dream I've been having. I was dreaming that I was dancing in this courtyard. I remember the grass is in the corner like moss on the side. It's really beautiful day. I, I just have a good energy when I'm dancing. And she goes, what a beautiful space. I wonder where that is and what that means. That night, I had the same dream. In the morning, I told my mom, I just had this dream. We were getting ready to do some storytelling at the university, and she was in the bathroom brushing her hair. I laid on her bed and I talked to her about my dream and how I was twirling in my regalia, and just then I looked at the TV, and there was the courtyard. I couldn't believe it, my mind was blown. I called my mom over, look at this, look, this is the courtyard, this is exactly it. Right when she looked over, it said, visit Italy. Wow, okay. I guess we're going to Italy, my mom said. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to do some storytelling there. And I said, no, not we. In my dream, it's just me. I think I'm meant to go by myself. And my mom looked at me and said, OK, well, we'll see how it all comes together. Two months later, we're doing a presentation at the Mikasuki Festival. It was an awesome time. It was a six-day festival, and I was there with my family, and it was like the good old days, uh, us performing on stage and me being an awestruck of my parents sharing their stories. Just then, we were backstage. The director of the other dance company comes bursting in. Can anybody travel with us to Italy, they said. We need one woman dancer. Now, I'm actually really attached to my parents. I like to have them everywhere with me. And I was like, I'll go, I'll do it. And I couldn't even believe it that I was agreeing. And I didn't even know this dance company, but I knew I had to get to Italy. I needed to go there. And before I could even take it back, they said, great, we'll connect with you later. Boom, the door shut. I was like, what did I just agree to? What is happening here? But we did it. In April, I gave up my crown. And in May, I was off. It was so exciting because as we were traveling up in the air, I thought, I wonder if I'm going to find this courtyard. I wonder what's going to happen. What's it going to be like? And as we get there, I would find my very best friend. Tony was traveling with me. And there, he would take me to different pizzerias and to the cafes, and we would do performances and run alongside the water. And it was the best time of my life. Finally, at the end of the tour, I was talking with my mom. And she said, how is it going? Have you found the courtyard yet? And I said, no, but Tony took me to pizza, and Tony took me to the riverside, and Tony took me to this courtyard. And I was, everything was Tony, Tony, Tony. And my mom would go, OK, well, I'm hearing a lot of Tony and not a lot of this courtyard. You have one day left. Um, let me know if you find it. And I said, for sure. And at this time, this is a video chat. And we're talking. And she goes, oh, let me tell you. We're here in Wetaskiwin. And she turned the video over. And she said, do you remember this park that we're at? We're visiting auntie and uncle. Just as she turned the video over, it was my dream. The hill, the clear blue sky. I thought, oh wow, this looks really familiar. It wasn't until the first blackbird flew by and the other five, and my stomach went into a knot. This is very familiar. Don't go on that hill, I said. <laughs> and she said, we're not going on the hill. What's wrong? What's the matter with you? And I thought. I, I don't know, but I have a bad feeling there. And she goes, don't worry, enjoy your travels, you'll be okay. You're far away from us, thousands of miles away. And I thought, that is strange. I never thought I would be this far away from my family. I went back and we were sitting on a picnic table waiting for our tour bus to come. Just then, Tony stood up and the sun was behind him. Rays radiated from his shoulders to his arms, and I swear I saw an angel appear. And I thought, is this the angel that is saving me from that day? Was something horrible going to happen? And if I ever had the chance to do it over again, this is what I would do again. And I thank the dream world for reminding me and for acknowledging to me to just listen. 
because sometimes divine intervention speaks in the most mysterious ways. Thank you so much. So Violet, when you think about it and you share now, is it that you always now still pay attention to your dreams? I, I'm not even like a dream logger or a dream collector, but I do know that dreams are so powerful and that they are speaking to us and telling us that. And it's really wild that I needed specific examples. <laughs> you specifically need to go here at this time. And uh, so I really do listen when my children talk about the dreams that they have. And it's like that little window into what is the deeper meaning to it. So I, I think it's really beautiful time when we can dream. I mean, as a mom right now, I don't remember the last time I had a good dream. <laughs> it's like we go to bed and we wake up and it's morning time already. But uh, when dreams come, I definitely listen and pay attention. Well, thank you so much for that beautiful story. And I think it carries the message that sometimes we need to really wonder if our dreams are telling us things about what we may do over or not do at all. <laughs> so thank you. Let's give her a beautiful round of applause for her story. Thank you. So I'd like to have an opportunity now to introduce you to our next teller. Our next teller, well, he's a very unique individual. So I'm going to first start out with sharing about Doug Bland. Doug Bland, well, he's done an enormous amount of work in interface and in community and the environment. And Doug Bland, believe it or not, was my first storytelling instructor. I walked into his classroom and I said, hmm, I wonder what storytelling is about. And so Doug, I want to thank you. Who would have known after all these years? Here we are together again. I'd like to give a warm welcome to an extraordinary advocate for the earth, and for the power of story to bring community together. Let's welcome up Doug Bland. Thank you, Marilyn, for the wonderful introduction and for your story. And Violet, your story was lovely as well. Thank you. In the days leading up to Halloween when I was 10 years old, 1962, um, Every night, we would turn on the TV and we'd watch the hound dog face of Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America. And uh, he was reporting the uh, development of a Russian warship that was traveling across the Atlantic Ocean on the way to Cuba. It was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at school, we were having duck and cover drills. The Jensen's next door were building a bomb shelter, and they let me know that there was just enough room for them and their family and not for me and mine. Every night, I'd go to bed and I'd pray, please, God, help there not to be any war or bombs. And then I couldn't think of anything else to say. About that same time, my friends and I, there were five of us in the neighborhood, started um, having sleepovers at each other's house every Friday night. And at about 11 o'clock, we'd turn on the TV just in time to hear, Welcome to Frightmare Theater! And inspired by all those things that went bump in the night, we decided that that Halloween we were going to be the most frightening characters we could possibly imagine. There were five of us. Uh, Rod was going to be the Mad Doctor. His um, uncle was a butcher, so he had this white butcher coat covered with blood and bile stains, and his mother was a nurse, so she had a stethoscope. He wore the stethoscope. His uh, dad was a carpenter, so he had this rusty old handsaw, the doctor's only surgical tool. And his patient was Bill with Excedrin headache number 128. The doctor's only remedy was amputate at the neck. Gary was going to be the swamp monster from the Blue Lagoon with his slimy seaweed hugs of death. I was going to be the mummy, groaning with 2,000 years of dusty death. The only bummer was that Mikey wasn't there. He had chicken pox at the time, so he was contagious, and he didn't hang out with us um, as we planned our costumes. 
So I went to my mother and I said, um, Mom, would you help me with my costume? She always helped me with my costume. She asked me what I wanted to be. I told her a mummy. She said, no way, no child of mine is going to get dressed up like a horrendous beast like that. So I went to my grandma. Now, my grandma had kind of a dramatic flair. She was the storyteller in my family. I said, Grandma, would you help me with my costume? I told her what I wanted to be. Actually, she had overheard my conversation with my mother. She said, all right. I'll help you, but let's not tell your mother just yet. So she got this old white sheet, and she tore it into strips, and then she took her pedal sewing machine, and she sewed the strips together. She wrapped me in that cloth, and she had taken me down to Newberry Five and Dime, where she helped buy this novelty sword, you know, the kind that sticks out one side, the hilt out one side, and the blade out the other. And uh, she had wrapped me and then put this sword on, and she was just dabbing some ketchup on one side when my mother walked in the room. And she said, Mother, how could you make such a hideous monster? And she stomped out. I said, Grandma, do, do you think I'm hideous? She said, I sure do. I said, thanks, Grandma. Well, we went to church the next Sunday. We were sitting there in the pew when Reverend Hollings got up to preach. Now, Reverend Hollings was new to the church, and we weren't too sure about him yet. He started preaching about how Halloween was a pagan holiday, and good Christian kids shouldn't get dressed up like witches and ghosts and mummies. I remember he said mummies because my mother looked over at my grandmother and gave her one of those I told you so looks. He said, this year, instead of a Halloween party, which we always had, we were going to have a harvest festival. And rather than have kids get dressed up like witches and ghosts and mummies, they would get dressed up like Bible characters. This would be, he said, not only educational, it would be inspirational. My grandmother stomped out of the church. She was still fuming at lunch. She said that Reverend Hollings, he wants to make everything so nice and so neat, and it's just not so, and besides, she said, it's boring, and then she stomped away from the dining table. I went to my grandmother, and I said, Grandma, I don't, I don't want to be a Bible character. The Bible is boring. She said, oh, no, honey, the Bible isn't boring. I said, it is too. You said it was. No. She said, what I said was Reverend Hollings is boring. And sometimes he makes the Bible sound boring, but the Bible isn't boring. I said, it is too. And she looked really sad until it was like this light came on inside her head because I could see it shining out of her eyes. She said, if Reverend Hollings wants Bible characters, we'll give him Bible characters. You have your friends come over to my house next Saturday morning, and I'll tell you some Bible stories. I said, Saturday morning? That's cartoon morning. Never mind, you have them there. So it wasn't easy, but I got them there. Grandma sat us down, and she told us Bible stories that we never heard in Sunday school. And then she helped us with our costumes. The night of the Harvest Festival came, we went to the fellowship hall, we could look in through the window and we could see all these Bible characters. There was Mary and there was Jesus and there was Peter and there was Paul and there was Moses and you, every one of them had dishcloth hair, head dress, a terry cloth robe and flip flops. You couldn't tell one character apart from the other if your life depended on it. And then we walked in and everybody turned the fact is, we didn't change very much from our original costume. You remember Rod was going to be the mad doctor with Excedrin headache number 128, his patient? He, became, he traded in his um, butcher's coat for a velvet robe covered with blood and bile. He traded in his stethoscope for a crown. He traded in his handsaw for an axe because he was Herod Antipas, who chopped off the head of John the Baptist. His patient, Bill, became John the Baptist. Grandma helped him button his coat up above his head, put some ketchup around the outside of the collar, and he came in saying, repent ye brood of vipers. Gary was going to be the swamp monster from the Blue Lagoon. 
Grandma made him this sign that said Psalm 74, 14, that tells about Leviathan, the sea monster, who's killing all the creatures of the earth, and God bashes it on the head and um, takes pieces of Leviathan and feeds all the creatures. So Grandma had helped him bake some sugar cookies, the same shape and size as the scales on his back, and he was handing those out to all the kids. I came in saying, up from the grave he rose, dressed as the mummy, because I was Lazarus, raised from the dead. I had gotten so attached to that sword that I didn't want to give it up. And Grandma told me there'd be questions, and there were. I told him what Grandma told me to say. The Bible isn't clear on just how Lazarus died. Mikey, you know, wasn't there as we planned our costumes, but he ended up with one of the best costumes of all. He, Grandma dressed him in rags, covered his scabs with calamine lotion. He had a silk, colorful skirt, and he came in saying, thank you very much, thank you very much, because he was the one leper who came back to give thanks. Reverend Hollings made a beeline for my grandmother and said, Mrs. Gibbon, are you responsible for this group of monsters? And my grandmother didn't miss a beat. She said, why, Reverend Hollings, I'm surprised at you. Is that any way to talk about Bible characters? Well, word spread like wildfire. The Bible characters, these are Bible characters? We've never heard about Bible characters like these. And right then and there, all those kids gathered there for the Harvest Festival nominated and then elected grandma to be the next Sunday school teacher, the only one ever elected to that high office by popular demand. Well, Reverend Hollings didn't last long at the church, but those stories that grandma told me to this day still help me have courage for all those things that go bump in the night. And that's the way it was October 31st, 19. 1962. Woo! Give him a round of applause. You know, Doug, I have to ask you at this point, do you think you might be inspired <laughs> to speak to the young people that are going to be upcoming in Halloween and have them create costumes with Bible stories? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you were going to ask me if I was inspired by my grandmother, and <laughs> I, I certainly was. There's uh, no doubt about that. Yeah. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Beautiful. So what I'd like to do now is invite both Doug and Violet to come and sit with us so we can have a chat. And at the same time, open it up not only to the chat box of questions and the audience that's watching us, but at the same time, invite every single one of you to ask questions and engage in a little bit of a dialogue about gathering together in this very unique time. So let's give them a chance to come in and get settled. So the first thing I want to do is find out if there's anybody in the audience that has a question that you would like to ask at this point, because we do have someone who will come by and give you a chance to, to speak. And or you'll just ask the question, I'll be more than happy to repeat it as quickly as I can. But first, give us your first name. So let's reach out to the audience. Anybody have a question right now? Don't be shy. This is the greatest time. We haven't had a chance to come together and be with people. Yes, go for it. Your name? Hi, Chloe. What's your question? Well, why don't we give our guests a chance to answer? Doug, what do you think? Well, um, both um, our storytellers are um, more comfortable with traditional stories. I'm actually more comfortable with the personal story. So for me, it wasn't as difficult as a, a transition to tell a personal story tonight. It was very nerve-wracking for me to uh, tell a personal story. Definitely felt a lot more vulnerable. Um, I have the traditional stories kind of played out like a cartoon in my head, so I can embellish a certain character or take away a certain part. 
um, that feeds, if it's children I'm speaking to or adults or, or our elders. So definitely with a personal story, um, I don't know, I don't know where because uh, especially with traditional stories, the lesson is what's really important because at the end of the story, you don't say what the lesson is. It should just be kind of transpired. And in the personal story, I'm like, I don't know if I've, I even learned the lesson. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was definitely a, a lot more difficult, but, um, but very cool. I'd like to approach that question from the standpoint of view as a traditional teller. In the context of the traditions that I come from, from West Africa, Nigeria, the Yoruba traditions of story. And we say that every story you tell, whether you're telling that story through a mythic symbol, or you're telling that through what we see today in language like folk tales and fairy tales, that all those stories are on some level or another representing who you are. They are personal. And when we teach storytelling at South Mountain Community College, one of the things that I remind my students is every story that you tell tells on you. Whether it's a mythic story, or whether it's a folk tale, or a fairy tale, or a Pokwa story. If you look deep enough into the symbol, there's a little bit of personal elements in there. When I use the term traditional myself, it's because for me, I want to continue to reinforce the lineages that I come from. And those lineages and the rootedness that those stories gave, that sometimes we have a tendency to think, are not relevant today, but they indeed are because all stories are eternal. So I think that's the way that I would answer that question as a traditional. Is anybody else having a question here? So I'm gonna ask a question to both of you. So when we were thinking about telling stories, what inspired you to tell the story with that concept of do-over? Go ahead. <laughs> Um, definitely, I like to kind of live life without feeling that there's regret, that there was something that I wish I would have done over because when I do look at my life, I, I am really grateful for the people who have come into it, the stories that I've been told, um, the experiences. I remember finding out when I was young that we were actually really, really poor. And I, when people talk about, you know, remember how poor we were and we couldn't do this? And I remember thinking, what, we were poor? When were we poor? And I just think the genius of my parents for being so creative with us. Uh, one time we got a disposable camera and we got dressed super fancy and we took pictures and those are in our photo albums and that's my favorite day because we got to dress so fancy and I got to have my purse. And being poor was awesome to me. <laughs> so definitely I don't regret any of the decisions. So when I thought about do over, I thought I don't think I have anything that I would do over, but I have been guided, and when I did talk to my husband, um, by the way, my husband is Tony. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, all lines lead to this man that I just love so much. Beautiful, Doug. I think for me, the uh, do-over aspect of my story was um, giving me an opportunity to try something at a deeper, more significant level. So there were these costumes that we were just wearing to scare people. <laughs> Uh, maybe psychologically, though we didn't uh, know it at the time, it was a way to deal with the things that were scaring us at the time, mm -hmm. but we weren't conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And then Grandma helped us um, find some deeper meaning. And the same thing with the Bible stories, you know, they were boring. Mm -hmm. And then to do over again those stories and to hear them interpreted through my grandmother's imagination and creativity uh, gave them more power the second time around. Well, it's so inspirational to really hear how each of us in many different ways kind of thought through what do-over meant. For me, I kept thinking about where we are today with climate change and everything that's happening. And the first story that came to me, it just came to me was you need to tell this story. One, because it's not recorded or written, so to speak. And second, because it's an opportunity to really be able to share a point of view about how we can always have a chance, no matter what we're doing,
to do things over again, and specifically for the next seven generations to come, because indeed, this story is so relevant to the future and to the children, and they are the next seven generations to come. Well, I notice in the chat box here that we have some questions. And the, one of the questions is from Tracy. Tracy, she has a question for you, Violet. Who is your family, who in your family is most inspirational to you? She wants to know. Um, it's not just one person. It's definitely both my mom and my dad. They are incredible storytellers. Uh, as we would travel across the country going to powwows in the summertime, um, they knew traditional stories all across Native America, all across Canada and the United States. They would talk about the mountains that we would go by and they would talk about the sleeping giants that were underneath them. And I would wait to see if one of the mountains moved to see if the giants are going to wake up. We would talk about trickster that would be in the form of coyote and rabbit. Uh, I remember we were traveling in New Mexico and the coyote was standing there and he ran into the road and he stopped and he ran back. And we all pulled over and we said, Coyote is telling us something. And as we pulled over, my mom said, does everyone have their seatbelts on? None of us had our seatbelts on. So we clicked our seatbelts on, we got ready, we got back on the road. And not two minutes later, we hit a huge cow, the biggest cow ever. And it crashed right into our windshield. And if we hadn't stopped, if Coyote hadn't warned us to keep our seatbelts on, who knows what might have happened? And now when I see Coyote out there with my children, I'm like, hey, do, are we buckled up? Are we safe? Are we here? <laughs> it's time to put screens down and let's read a book now or we talk about the, the, the landscape outside. So both of my parents were incredible and my dad does a lot of his storytelling with song as well. And so that's something that I just, I carry those stories with me and I'm still trying to learn them because I don't know how they keep all of the intricate details in their minds and their brains and so they inspire me daily. Mm, beautiful. Well we have another person in the chat box and this one is called the Beat Box Storyteller. <laughs> and yes, I happen to know the Beat Box Storyteller. You're welcome, Mario. Mario's asking the question of whether or not in the traditions that I carry, are there other stories that are linked to other animals as counterparts? And absolutely there are, there are many more. In the context of the goddess of the river, Oshun, she predominantly walks beautifully in the symbols of the birds, and the peacock is the major one that we look at. And when I think about, if we were thinking about a four-legged creature, we would probably say that it's a cat, and it probably isn't a lion, it would more than likely be a jaguar. So hopefully that answers your question. And then now we have someone, uh, can we move it down, who is car, something grabber. How did you end up telling stories at this thing? Well, I'm not sure who it is, but I think, Doug, you might want to start. How did you end up telling stories at this thing? <laughs> well, I got an uh, email invitation from the Care Center, and uh, it sounded like a great opportunity. I thought uh, first, no, I don't really have a story about do-over. And then I thought, you know, this is really close to Halloween. Maybe that's a do-over story. So mm -hmm. I said yes. And it sounds like Tracy has another question for you, Doug. Which animal is your favorite and could, and could represent you at some point in your life? Oh, let me see. I remember growing up um, and um, Chipmunk was always my favorite character because Grandma told me a story about Chipmunk uh, confronting Grizzly Bear. Mm -hmm. And the stripes on Chipmunk's back are from this one creature who stood up against Grizzly Bear who wanted it to be winter all the time when no other creature would do that, a little bit like Peacock. And uh, so those scars are still there, and, uh, and I think about Chipmunk as one of my heroes. Mm. Violet, how about you? Um, well, oh, the animal? <laughs> Yeah, one animal would be <laughs> okay, your favorite. Okay, well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, I am a cat person, so I love uh, everything cat. However, my nickname is Weasel. 
And when I was younger, I would be able to move through crowds really quickly. And if you ever see a weasel, um, they dart really, really quickly. Also called, what did they do? They called it another name in other areas. But up north, we call them weasels. And actually, they are adorned on many of our regalia. So they get to change their color with the season. And I think that they're just really beautiful, underrated animals. <laughs> so I have to give a shout out to weasels. Well, in our tradition, we do have different animals that are associated, and we know about the bird clan. But when it comes to the sea, which is the traditional goddess that I have most relationship with, it would absolutely be dolphins. I love, love dolphins, especially because they carry that sonic sound of connecting us to the land and to the earth and to the sea. So that's how to answer that question. Now, someone by the name of May, I can see here, or Mark. I forgot my glasses, ladies and gentlemen. So do you also all teach storytelling? Well, we know I teach storytelling, definitely at South Mountain Community College. I predominantly work with early college youth, helping them to learn to reclaim voice, reclaim kinesthetic communication, and to become part of learning community, not only by telling, but by listening. How about you, Doug? I know you used to teach. I was in your class, and how do you feel now? What are you doing now? Yeah, I still use storytelling as the primary way to communicate with people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, one of my heroes is a guy named Gary Paul Nabhand, who is an ethnobotanist. And he says, if we want to restore the earth, we need to restory the earth. Mm -hmm. We need to tell new stories Beautiful. that connect us in a relationship that's been broken. Mm -hmm. And story is the best way to do that. Beautiful. That, yeah, yeah, that was beautiful, Doug. Thank, thank you. Yeah, go for it. I, I'm actually just sharing now this new webinar on my website. It's called um, The Art, uh, no, <laughs> sorry, Storytelling as a Tool for Change. And it's looking at storytelling through experience and becoming an expert storyteller through your experience and how we kind of navigate the world and where storytelling could be relevant as an educator, as a caregiver. And so that's how I'm teaching storytelling right now on my website is w.violetduncan.com. So, yes, go for it. She was. Um, she's Irish. Is that enough said? <laughs> <laughs> I think she got it from her tradition. I don't know whether there was a storyteller in her family that uh, inspired her, uh, but certainly um, her Irish Celtic tradition was a part of uh, what influenced her. Mm. Thank you. Well, there was a question from Tracy and then we're gonna to start to wrap it up. But her question was, thank you, Tracy, so much for your feedback on uh, my vocalizations. And do I have any or not formal training? Well, I don't know how to sing, is what I tell everybody. But I know how to chant. And so oftentimes, when I am doing these chants, that's what they are, they're chants. I don't see them as singing because I don't know how to sing, but I do know how to chant. So thank you for the compliment. And so with that, um, is there anyone with a final question before we wrap this up? Yes. Uh, I was just curious about the setting in which you were told these wonderful stories, and like, like how do you hear stories? I guess in what, like when you were in the uh, German school, mm -hmm. uh, where were you told stories? And then also with that, uh, you know, what's your favorite so I'll have Violet, you start, and then Doug, and then I'll answer. Please. Yeah, so traditionally, storytelling was done in the wintertime. And so it'd be after you're done gathering throughout the summertime, and you're done hunting, and you're kind of smoking your meat to make pemmican, it would be a time, and pemmican is like candy. Um, and so you would, everything that you've harvested, you kind of have, and you just binge <laughs> storytelling. And it was a wonderful time because they say we tell stories of trickster and the best stories in the winter because that's when bear goes to sleep. 
And if you are not a good person in this life, you come back as a bear in your next life and you don't get to hear the stories <laughs> in the winter time. And so it, it, you're like, wait a minute, I don't want to miss out on this. And so you don't want to be a bad person or an unkind person. But now uh, times have changed and my very favorite times that I catch stories are in the kitchen, usually when we're preparing and somebody asks a question like, um, where did these Saskatoon berries come from? How come we're gonna do it this way? And a story will come out, or if somebody's not being kind, a story about kindness and why it's important will come out. And that's my favorite time to tell stories. It's usually when I'm driving with my children because I got them all buckled in and they're forced to listen to me that I like to share my stories with them. And uh, I think that's what my parents did too as we would look at the mountains and it would kind of connect them and make them realize that we are not just one family kind of living on this earth, that we are connected through plants and animals and water beings, that we are all a part of it. Doug? I think my favorite setting for uh, stories is uh, a setting where you've got a real diverse group of people. So we had an event um, where there were uh, com people from an evangelical community, very conservative, uh, liberal, Unitarian Universalist, and a Jewish synagogue together. Now these folks generally don't rub elbows with each other, but we asked them to tell stories about times when they felt like Moses, they were standing on holy ground. And at first they're in their little tribes, but by the end of the evening as they share their stories, you couldn't tell one group from another group. Mm. And uh, we live in such a divided uh, culture right now any opportunity we have to really sit down with each other and share stories is golden. Well, in my case, I come from living between the United States and the island of Puerto Rico. And I think for me, sitting with my elders, when we would have what we would call ajiras, where we would go to the beach every weekend, and we slept on the beach, and we camped on the beaches, and there was always stories, 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 whether they were personal stories or gossip we shouldn't be listening to. So story was a rich way to communicate. It was a way in which to evoke feelings and share thoughts and teach things. And it would just be so natural and spontaneous. You, you'd ask a question as a little kid, why did we put, dig the pit to put the pig in in the way that we did to roast it? And there was always somebody to come and tell a story about when it was done and how it was done and why it was done. And so story was a way to communicate. So from a child on, I learned that story is the heart of who we are, the heart of how we communicate. What we have to continuously work on is how to listen. And so I learned early on that the gift of story starts first with the power of listening, to really hear and listen with your whole heart and your whole mind. And I enjoy teaching that to a lot of young people that I teach in my classes now because I work predominantly with a lot of young early college students. And they discover their voice and they know we're all born storytellers at the heart we just now have to continue to work on how to listen. That's, those are my thoughts. Yeah. Okay. So with that, we'd like to give all of you a round of applause. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be in the room with human beings and people. And we also like to thank all of you who are watching. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughts. And please let us not forget, every month, every Wednesday, we have gathering together. Please come out, listen to the stories, tune in. And we know that the schedule will shift in the next upcoming holidays. But continue to support the gathering. Continue to support the work. Thank you so much, and have a lovely and safe evening. Thank you. everyone for watching today. Our next gathering is actually not on the final Wednesday of the month. It will be on November 17th and it's undoing time, 6.30 p.m. That will be a hybrid event again. We'll have RCP information and streaming information up very soon. So thank you for tuning in tonight and have a good rest of your week. <laughs>